Yes. Oh my gosh. I could worship with Courtney and Michael Ellis every single day if they would just come to my apartment and wake me up instead of my iPhone alarm. That would be so much better. Come on out, Sam. That would be handy. I've got a couple of things in my hand. Thank you. Way to go, Sam. MVP. <laughs> Awesome. I really am so glad to be with you and to see you. It has been a minute, and I know this spring has just been so crazy for all of us and certainly crazy for Woven, but I'm just thrilled for us to be back in the regular rhythm and routine of Woven and Thread Groups and just delighted to welcome in this spring with you. Uh, before we get started, can I just pray for us? I know we just prayed a lot, but let's just, it won't be as long. <laughs> God, we adore you. You are our good father. You know our needs before we do, before a word is on our lips, you know it all together. You go before us, you follow behind, you hem us in, and you brought us into this space tonight by your spirit that we would see you high and lifted up. Lord Jesus, you are our rescue, our deliverer, our defender, our savior. There's nobody else like you. And so right now, I just pray for all of us, myself included, would we see you and you only? Will you make the most of this time together? All of the craziness that's happened this week, today, this month, this year, maybe our whole life, would you silence it even now? And would you speak to us? We're listening. God, we want to hear from you. We need to hear from you. This time is yours and so are we. Have your way among us for your glory and our good. Amen. Thank you. We were made for that posture of prayer. Well, if you worship with us on Sunday mornings here at PCBC, then you know that we are in the middle of a sermon series called The Gospel According to Jesus as we're going through the Gospel of Matthew together. And I had the joy of getting to preach Jesus this past Sunday in our chapel and sanctuary as we have been looking at Jesus as King. And we were in Matthew 26, verses 6 through 13, looking at the anointing of the King when Mary of Bethany anoints Jesus. And so when I realized that I was assigned to preach the Sunday before Woven, a text about a woman in the Bible, I thought, well, this would be a missed opportunity if we don't get to go further into her story throughout the month of April. So here we go. Our Woven woman for the month is Mary of Bethany. But on Sunday, I will not repeat the same sermon that I did on Sunday. Many of you were there. Don't worry. No way, Jose. But if you missed it, I do encourage you to go online and check it out because it will give you a fuller picture and understanding of Mary's story because I won't be covering that today. You can go to pcbc.org slash sermons if you're looking for that. But for tonight, we get to go a little further. So I will not be reading from Matthew 26. I will jump in at Matthew four, I mean Mark 14, Mark 14, which is the same story, but in a little bit different language, just because I just mentioned it. So if you missed Sunday or you worship somewhere else on Sundays, and I'm so glad you're here, that's not a requirement to be here at Woven. <laughs> uh, I want to make sure that that stage has been set for all of us. Uh, so we're actually, interestingly enough, we're going to be starting at, chronologically would be the last story of Mary of Bethany in our Gospels. So after I share this, we're going to jump back to the beginning and journey forth. So hopefully you're there with me. So let's jump in. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 3. It says, while Jesus was in Bethany, P.S. I'm reading from the NIV. I know I always do different versions. So two things. You can join me in the NIV, or some of y'all love story time. That's a gift I like to offer you at Woven. So if you just need to lean back and listen and enjoy the story, you're allowed to do that. I promise. Uh, Jesus still loves you, and you're still allowed to be in a Baptist church if you just listen to the story. But do whatever you please. Mark chapter 14, starting in verse 3. While Jesus was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. That's Mary, by the way. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. 
Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So other than the fact that Jesus intervenes and defends her and says that she's done this beautiful thing to me, to him, which how can you not love that? My favorite thing here is verse eight. Jesus says, she did what she could. She did what she could. That might not sound that great, but I wanna tell you when Jesus said she did what she could, he was not condemning her. He was not looking down upon her. He was not holding up a measuring stick to her. When he said she did what she could, he said that in great love, delight, and adoration. Friends, I don't know who else in this room tonight needs to hear Jesus say over you, hear the word of God. She did what she could. Because what did she do? What could she do? She poured out her heart before him, didn't she? She worshiped him. She did what she could. Do you know it's grace that we get to worship Jesus as Lord? I still don't understand why he opened my eyes to see that he's Lord and he's worthy of following all the days of my life. I still don't understand how he's prompted me to say a word that goes across the nations and throughout history for us to say hallelujah, praise the Lord. That makes no sense to those who don't yet know Jesus, but for those of us who do, We have the privilege of crying out that he's worthy. He freed us to do that. She did what she could. What could she do? She poured out her heart in worship before God. And did you know that's all he ever asked us to do in the first place? I got to imagine looking at you tonight, I'm not the only one who has felt so distracted, so overwhelmed by so many other things. And I have lost sight of the King of Kings, of the one thing he asked me to do and the only thing that matters, to pour out my heart before him in worship. Do you believe that everything else follows from that? Everything. In the Psalms, you might know it says, be still and know that I am God, but it doesn't stop there. It says, be still and know that I am God and I will be exalted amongst the nations. That makes no sense. (laughs) I'm just being honest. How in the world is he to be exalted amongst the nations if we are to be still? That makes no sense. But he says, be still and know that I am God and I will be exalted among the nations, meaning he cannot be exalted among the nations until he is exalted in our own hearts in us. He cannot be glorified through us until he is glorified in us. She did what she could. She poured out her heart in worship before him. And that's all he's asked of us. And it's what we've been freed to do. I think somebody else surely needs to hear that tonight besides just me. So we're going to jump forward and look at Mary. We're jumping forward in your Bible. You're jumping back in time to Luke chapter 10. Again, feel free to enjoy story time. I gotta say, this is the story that I think Mary of Bethany is most known for, which is kind of interesting because it's only five verses. Five verses in the whole Bible. And this is what she's known for. Her and Martha, right? Mary and Martha, sisters, M and M. And they have a brother named Lazarus, but we don't really talk about him with them a ton. It's usually Mary and Martha, okay? So you may have heard this story before, but let's jump in. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed, only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. All right, so I'm just confessing 
that while I think, I'd like to think that the way God has shaped me in my core is the heart that reflects Mary right now, <laughs> this month, this year, I am very much in Martha mode, <laughs> very much so. And so very distracted. Like I said, so many things, so many things. And what do those distractions lead to? They lead to me being worried and upset about so many things. My mom is in this room. She can testify. She's been on the other end of this phone way too long, listening to me just let it all out. <laughs> and I know I'm not a lot alone in the room with that. So distracted by so many things. But what hits me is it says Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. According to who? Who said they had to be made? Jesus? Her guest? No. The disciples? No. Her brother and sister? Nope. Who said those preparations had to be made? I think it was Martha. And I don't think I've ever felt so at home in the text. <laughs> I will call out Whitney is somewhere here, and she called me out in a meeting yesterday, um, me thinking I needed to keep stuff up just for you tonight. And she said, um, you mean your own requirements? She was right. <laughs> So maybe I'm not the only one who just holds myself to really high standards, standards I don't hold to anybody else to, standards that not even Christ our King, who is perfect, holds me to. Only me. It's very distracting, very overwhelming. And here's what's kind. Martha is so busy, and she's in the right spot. She's, Jesus is coming, and I just want it all to be ready for him. I want, it, I want it to be great. How good can it be for Jesus? And Jesus comes, and she's like, why? Ugh, my, my sister's not helping me. Why don't you get her to help me? And Jesus says, Martha. And she's thinking, why don't you just get my sister to help me? And Jesus says again, Martha. Now, I know I'm not the only one who has heard this text preached, and people reference the Brady Bunch. Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. And they'll be like, and Jesus was like, Martha, Martha, Martha. But I don't think Jesus was like that. Forgive me. I think Jesus was extremely kind because I get to know Jesus through this word he's given us. And I know him by his spirit. And I know him through you. And Jesus wasn't like, Martha, Martha, Martha. That is not his character. Instead, I think Jesus was like, Martha. Martha. You see, Martha was so busy doing so much good for Jesus. She didn't even hear him speaking to her, calling her by name. Please tell me I'm not alone in that, that we can get so busy doing so much good for Jesus, and we don't even hear him speaking to us. We don't even hear him calling our name. How kind, Martha. Martha. You're worried. And you're upset about so many things. But few things are needed. Indeed, only one. I love that he gradually takes her on this journey towards one thing. You see, he's not condemning. He gets her attention, helps her hear his voice, shows her what's true and what's real, goes to the source, and leads her to this one thing. What is the one thing? Well, we see Mary. He says, Mary chosen what's better, and it will not be taken away from her. And Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. I want to tell you something before we keep going. The solution that Jesus offers her is not, I wish you were more like your sister. Again, not the character of Christ. It's common to hear people say, comparison is the thief of joy, and I think it's popular because it's true. Straight from the pit of hell. No way was Jesus like, I wish you were more like your sister. And if you're here tonight and you're like, I just wish I was more like that girl, she really seems to get it. Shut that out. Shut it down. I once heard a Bible teacher say, the voice of God is always one that draws us near, not one that casts us aside. That is not the voice of our Father. 
He calls you daughter. He calls you by name. And he will gently and lovingly show you the way. He'll bring us back that old song to the heart of worship. It's true. It's always been about him. And we have always existed to do just that. Worship him with our whole heart. And that word worship, we tend to only use in the church. But I'm here to say, I keep saying it. Do you hear me? Pour out your heart before him. Pour out your heart before him. Yes, that's prayer, but it's worship. It's a relationship. It's listening. It's precisely what Jesus came here to offer us. Jesus was not willing to save us from afar. He came and got right where we are. Look at the way he lived his life. I read in Mark 14, the story starts by Jesus a few days before he was about to die for us, gathering with close friends and sharing a meal together in their home. Jesus loved to be with us, and he still does. It's the whole reason he came. If you know him, your relationship with him is not activated when we get to heaven. It starts at the moment of your salvation, and he loves to be with you. He loves to hear from you. He knows what's on our heart, but he wants us to pour out our hearts to him because he knows we can't carry it. In the same way, mom, thank you for answering the phone. That will never satisfy me. And she knows that. We finish every call, and I know she takes it all to Jesus in prayer. And so do I. Because it's that space that we are created for. You cannot scare him away. He already knows. Do you know he adores you at every moment, in every state? So much so he died for you. Y'all, there's not another love like that out there. So it's not, I wish you were more like your sister. But it's, look, Look what she's chosen. It's a choice. She's chosen what's better, and it won't be taken away from her. Sis, hear me. When we choose Jesus, we will never lose Jesus. If that's a rhyme you need to remember, that's fine. I'll be as cheesy as God needs me to be if the truth will land. If you choose Jesus, you will never lose Jesus. Choose him. Hold fast to him. Hold tight to him. Pour out your heart before him. Look to him above and beyond all the mess that we deal with every single day. Somehow, some way, so many of us believe the lie that we've got to do so much more than this for Jesus. And in our doing so much more for Jesus, we actually settle for so much less than Jesus. He asks us to pour out our hearts before him, to be with him, listen to him. I think if there's something we can learn from Mary, it's that she really makes the most of whoever is with her in that moment. She's so present. That's so reflective of Christ. No wonder they got along. (laughs) So she's sitting at Jesus' feet. She's listening to what he has to say because what he has to say is better than what anybody else could say. And it's certainly better than the thoughts that are playing in Martha's mind. I haven't done enough. It's not ready. It's not good enough. Why is my sister not helping me? Jesus says, Martha, Martha, come to me. Listen to me. Look upon me. I'll give you rest. That's the character of Christ. A lot of times he'll approach us that way, not really with a, punch in the gut or a loud scream or a storm, but just a gentle, hey, hey, Megan, Megan, you're worried and distracted about so many things, but not much is needed. Actually, just one thing. Come to me. Pour it all out. You've lost your way, but I'm bringing you home. He loves to bring us home. Let's keep going. We'll jump into John. Last time we see Mary of Bethany in the Gospels, and actually, this is a little longer story. We'll move through it quick. But this is the only time we see Mary of Bethany speak in the scriptures. Now, obviously, let's be real. Likely, she said more than one sentence in her life. (laughs) We only see the one (laughs) in the scriptures. And interestingly, it's the same sentence that Martha says earlier. So let's jump in and see. We'll be in John chapter 11, and I will be moving quick. (laughs) Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister, Martha. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. 
When he heard this, Jesus said, the sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, Mary, and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Let's jump to 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask, Jesus said to her. Your brother will rise again, Martha answered. I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she'd said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. I knew that you always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did believed in him. I know that's a whopper. Here's what I have to say. First off, I said Mary makes the most of who she's with in the present moment. Now, I thank God I've not lost one of my brothers, but when I was younger, I was 13, the closest thing I had to a sister, Tiffany, was 17, and she died in a car wreck, and I still remember us going up on that snowy, cold day in February up to my aunt and uncle's house, and how their community would come in to comfort them, to mourn with them, to grieve with them, and I can still see my aunt crumbling in the arms of every person who came to grieve with her as she relived over and over and over that suffering. This is where Mary is. She's been grieving for four days. Her community is there. Jesus comes, but he's not arrived yet. Martha gets up and goes to him, but Mary stays. He's not here yet. Martha, I'm not going to assign the tone that she used with what she said to Jesus, but here's what's beautiful. She says, I know he'll rise on the last day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection. I am the life. And no, when you look through the gospel of John, every time you see Jesus say, I am, he is echoing what God said in Exodus when Moses said, who will I say sent me? And God says, tell him that I am sent you for I am who I am and I will be who I will be. Jesus says, he reveals who he is to Martha right here. She thinks she knows, but she had not yet believed. And there's a difference between knowing and believing. Jesus knows that what we know won't save us. What we know won't sustain us. What we know won't transform us. But what we believe will save us. What we believe will sustain us. And what we believe will transform us. So Jesus says, do you believe this? And she says, yes, you are the Messiah. 
She runs to her sister. The teacher's calling. He's here. And do you notice now Mary, who was fully engaged in grieving with her community, pops right up. I cannot even imagine my aunt in that situation popping up, running out the door, and people being like, What's happening, right? So, of course, they come with her. And she meets Jesus. He hasn't moved. But he calls to her. At the sound of his voice, she knows it. She doesn't even hear it twice. She goes to Jesus. She falls at his feet. You see in verse 32, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. Yes, that's worship. But I also believe that Jesus has become her safe space, her refuge, where she can pour out her heart before him and know she won't be judged. What's better, she'll be healed. She'll be loved. It's never wasted when she pours out her heart before him. He fills us in his presence. And so I imagine, says she's weeping, that the minute she sees Jesus, yeah, she's been comforted by the community, but it cannot compare to when she sees her teacher on the road and she falls before him and she says, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus knows. That's all she says. And later we see that Jesus weeps because what breaks your heart breaks his. In fact, I think it breaks it more. Again, my mom's here, and I've got to believe I'm not a mom, but the things that hurt me hurt her more. How much more must it hurt our Heavenly Father? This is not what he intended, this world of pain, and it's not forever. But God's going to be glorified. I'm going to wrap us up in a minute, but I don't want you to miss what I closed with. Verse 45, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus did and believed in him. Belief has always mattered to Jesus. You may notice this is the third person that God has raised from the dead since we started Woven. <laughs> that wasn't intentional. But here's the thing. Dead people don't stay dead around Jesus. <laughs> Lazarus needed to die so that God would be glorified. These Jews would not have known. This many, they would not have believed in Jesus if they did not see the miracles. And I don't think it was just that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. I think that they brought the whole community with Mary to see her encounter before her maker in the place of refuge, in the place of worship, of pouring out her heart. Friends, that's what the world needs. Yes, it's cool to see somebody who can raise someone from the dead, but that's also kind of crazy. <laughs> what drew, drew those people? I can't tell you, but I got to believe some of them were hungry for a relationship that Mary had with her maker, her savior, her teacher, that she could fall before him, cry out, not angry, not holding it against him, but pouring out her heart and looking for a healer. We're about to break for t uh, table talks. The question is always, how do you see your woman, your story? Y'all, I'm tongue twisted. <laughs> uh, how do you see your story and this woman's story? And that's still the question. And my prayer for all of us is that you will pour out your heart before God. He wants it. Every single day. One day we'll see him in heaven. He says that he has a room prepared for us. God is all about relationship. Father, Son, and Spirit. And he invites us by his grace into that family. He loves to love you. We let him. We love him right back. Go ahead and talk some on your tables for 10 minutes. How do you see your story? in Mary of Bethany's story. Okay, uh, y'all know I hate wrapping you up. Feel free to talk later, but just for those who need to scoot, I do try to tie us up a bit. Um, but I was sitting with uh, my mom and her friend, Vicki, and I just, she reminded me, Vicki reminded me of uh, something I meant to say that I didn't, made me laugh. She goes, you're so prepared. <laughs> and I was laughing because God literally made me an object lesson for today. Because last night at bedtime, full transparency here, my best friend Brooke texts me and she's an incredible prayer warrior. And she says, I'm praying for you and the women of Woven tomorrow. And I said, well, keep praying because this is the first time in my life I literally have no idea 
what God wants me to say to you the night before, less than 24 hours before. I'd done the research, I'd done the studying, but had not received the message. Nope. She's like, okay. And so I wake up this morning and I sit in the scriptures in the presence of God, much like Mary, listening. And it was clear as day, clear as day, as he guided me. His power is perfected in our weakness. He calls us to that one thing. I feel like there's many things. I have said, Lord, here, in this role here, there's so much that has to be done and and I got to do it. I got to do it. And he's like, one thing. This is primary. You cannot do those things if you don't come to me. Come to me and watch me be God on your behalf. Be still and know that I will be exalted amongst the nations. Be still and know that I am God and watch me be God for you. It's amazing. It's amazing. May we not believe the lie that we're called to so much more for Jesus that we miss Jesus. We're called to him, to put our hearts before him, to listen to him. And I will tell you the primary way that we hear from him is what? It's on my table, but his word, his written word for us. His Holy Spirit will illuminate. He will speak to you. I promise you, open it up. The enemy will stop at nothing to keep you from opening that. Wherever it sits on your nightstand and it gathers dust, you'll feel like, God, it's been so long. How can I open it now? This is an old school reference, but if any of y'all saw The Notebook, (laughs) Ryan Gosling, anybody? There's a scene where she's like on the tire swing about to get in the water and she's like nervous and of course kind of flirty too. But um, he's like, get in the water, get in, get in the water. (laughs) Anyone? Please. Uh, That's completely what Jesus does for us with his word. I'm fully convinced as the word just sits there, the Bible just sits there and God's ready to speak. And we're like, "Ah, I don't know. And God's like, get in, get in the word, get in the word. Okay. I'm as cheesy as I've ever been with y'all, but I cannot express enough my deep desire that comes from him. Get in his word, get in his presence, pour out your heart. He wants it. He will heal you. He will speak to you. He will mightily display his glory to you just as he did to Martha on the road. And he always did for Mary too. He will show you who he is. And not only will that be a rescue for you, it will be a rescue for many. As the world gets to see you worshiping your maker, trusting in him, in relationship, I promise you, people will be saved. This family will grow. And you'll have more friends to call on the name of the Lord with. But I'm promising you two things. That and the whole reason we're still here and not in heaven yet is because there are more people that God wants to call son and daughter. And he wants to use you to show them who he is. But don't get so caught up on trying to show him who Jesus is that you don't let him show you who he is. So if you hear from me tonight, it's this. Pour out your heart before Jesus continually. Continually. Whatever it looks like. Run to him. Fall at his feet. Maybe you need to hear that. Like when you get home tonight, it's been a long day. And you just fall into your favorite chair, your favorite spot on the couch, or you get in bed under your covers, whatever that place of rest is, I imagine that's what Mary did when she would fall at his feet. Sis, you can come undone before him, and he will put you back together, gently, kindly. And I warn you, don't look to anybody else to do that for you but him. It'll only lead to more brokenness. I know from experience. Look to him. Jump in a thread group. You'll see on your table, there's QR codes you can scan. We're meeting next week and then two weeks after that. It's not too late to join one. The spring's been crazy. So jump in and join one if you're not in one. I encourage you. Y'all have told me how much your thread groups mean to you. I love to hear it. If you're not in one, jump in. And then join us next month. I can't wait to see you. First Wednesday in May, may the fourth be with you. I'm not a Star Wars person. Is it Star Wars, Star Trek? Who knows? I don't. But I know that May the fourth is actually the night for Woven. So come to Woven, bring all your 
Star Wars, Star Trek gear. I have no idea. But you're welcome. I'm going to let you go and be quiet. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Feel free to talk amongst your tables. But leave here knowing that you are dearly, dearly loved by God. And you're loved by me too. So let's meet if we haven't met yet. And if you can help pick up tables, that'd be great. Have a great night. See you next month. <laughs>